uh, Igor Dotsenko uh, is an eminent researcher from uh, Laboratoire of Castel Porcel uh, College de France uh, from France. And uh, today I'm very excited to hear from him about circular rhythmic atoms for quantum simulations. Please, Igor, the floor is yours. So thank you, Taha, for having introduced me. Uh, thank you, the organizers, for inviting me to this conference. And also, I'd like to thank the speakers that I have heard this morning with nice talks and nice discussions. So some questions were really nicely <clears throat> presented, and uh, they will motivate some, some additional discussions for future. So today, I'm going to talk to you about some results that are obtained in our lab at uh, Laboratoire castle Bruxelles in Paris. It's experimental work where we are trying to build a quantum simulator with circular readback atoms. I will show you some preliminary results. I will give you ideas where we are going and try to give you some very general motivation for that. So of course, just since I'm the first in this session and I would like to give very, very naive and simple motivation why do we need a kind of quantum simulators and what does it mean? So if we just consider a very simple quantum system, as an example, spin one half particle in some external fields, and we know how to treat this problem analytically, theoretically, with no problems. If we're going for several particles in interactions, of course, the problem gets a bit more complicated. One of the reasons why, because the Hilbert space scales as two to the power n. So the problem is quantum, not classical. We have much more degrees of freedom including entanglement. So the problem becomes a bit more complicated, but still for several particles, we can solve it, uh, maybe not analytically, but numerically pretty, pretty, with pretty high precision. But when the problem becomes even more long, so we're going to more and more particles, of course, the problem of working with larger and larger Hilbert space and get the exact solution for the problem for the evolution becomes really more and more problematic. And for the moment, so if we would like really to go to the solid state physics and to simulate or to measure or to predict the properties of large crystalline structures, for the moment, we cannot do it better than with, I mean, we're limited to several tens of particles if we want to solve it exactly. And of course, this is not enough if we want to study the real crystals, for instance. And the current state of the art technology, if we consider the chain of n spins, is that up to 40 spins, we can solve the problem exactly just, for instance, by diagonalization. So we can find the eigenstates of the problem eigenvalues. If we're going beyond this number, diagonalization is not possible anymore. So uh, up to my knowledge, it takes too much uh, computing powers and the modern computers, supercomputers, are not allowed to uh, are not able to do this. So you can imagine 10 to uh, 2 to the power of 40, how many terabytes of information you need just to store this state, not talking about its organization. Of course, there are many methods that uh, that we use to overcome this problem. For instance, we can look for the just ground state of the problem using some standard or pretty well developed techniques. But if I do want to go to dynamics, if I want to see the spectrum, I want to see the evolution, the long distance correlations, quantum correlations, then the problem becomes more and more difficult to solve and to tackle. And in general, so the question for the spin systems is even is larger. It's not just one dimensional chains. It can be more complicated structures, it can be two, three dimensional structures. Here we can have several types of interactions. So interaction that we call it Ising. So it's just the sigma z, sigma z interaction, which is linked to the ferromagnetic properties or paramagnetic. It's just the fact that two spins opposite or parallel spins can um, attract or repel each other. Another type of interaction, what we call flip-flop, it's x, y, is the interaction when two sp spins can really exchange their excitation resonantly. So the system can be, even though Hamiltonian is simple, the system of many tens of hundreds of thousand particles is extremely difficult to tackle. But the questions that we can ask to such a system is very large. So we can go to the 
standard equation on the ground state, on the ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic orders. We can go to some quenching effects, uh, propagation of correlation. For instance, if we want to go for the problem of high temperature superconductivity, we can also think about the role of disorders in the system. We can think of thermalization, which requires not just the presence of some grounds, known ground state, but really the long-term evolution. So all these problems can be solved analytically nowadays. And now the question, the, the solution that, that we can try to get in order to overcome this problem is really try to go to what we call a simulator. So if we want to simulate a complicated system, so one of the way is to try to build a model system much smaller, better controllable, with very similar dynamics, at least in that properties that we're interested in, and then try to mimic the evolution of the complicated system like the motion of planets around the sun by some toy model, some model system, which mimics the main elements that we're interested in. For instance, the periods, the ratio of periods, and so on and so forth. Of course, the model is not the direct copy of the real system. It's not the same masses. It's, there is no gravity here, but at least the motion in which we're interested or periodicity can be really mimicked in this way. And of course, sometimes model systems, simulators, they can look even more different. And of course, one of the sim basic simulator of the solar system, as an example, is just uh, just clocks. So our usual clock with the with the clock hand is just a simulator of the motion of Earth around its its axis. So with all these, so if we want to go to the quantum systems of, and for instance, to simulate the spin systems. Uh, we have to find the uh, platforms with quantum particles, which can have more or less the same properties that we're interested in. And that is the two-level structure, uh, interaction between neighbors, uh, possibility to make complicated uh, geometry to mimic the 2D, 3D, and, and uh, 1D structures, and so on and so forth. Of course, now due to the second quantum revolution, which allowed us to nicely control individual quantum objects, quantum particles, and to preserve their coherence, we end up with many different platforms which propose some way to tackle the problem of quantum simulation or quantum computation, quantum trollage. So here I give I just a very brief reminder of some of such systems. So one of the simplest or historical one of the first are just ions trapped in the iron trap. You see every single spot is one ion. They can have the interaction with neighbors using the Coulomb um, force. They can be trapped in the electric fields. So we can go to the cavity QD where array of atoms trapped, uh, placed inside uh, high finesse mirrors can exchange virtual photons between each other. And this can serve as a bus which connects any two atoms or any two particles in these in this array. Of course, we can go for cold atoms, which are trapped in light fields, and this creates naturally very regular structures, not just rectangular, but some more complex uh, interference patterns can be proposed and realized. We can also go for polar molecules, which have very high dipole moment, so this allows really long-range interaction. Then in the solid states, we have lots of different solutions, starting from superconducting circuits, which are now the main elements used in most quantum computers on the market, and down to quantum dots, spintronics, nanophotonics, where we can shape the light fields and so on and so forth. So the number of platforms is increasing every day, or maybe not day, every month. We have more and more platforms. We have very complex systems. We have hybrid systems. And what we're interested in, we would like to implement the Rubik atoms, to use Rubik atoms to a simulate a solid state or condensed matters. So with that, I go to the main part of my talk. So uh, the outline is pretty simple. So first I will give you the introduction to the Rubik atoms, uh, who they are, how to manipulate them, how we plan to use them. And then I will show you arrays of our trapped atoms. So how we can go from single atoms to the structures of, of special geometry. And finally, I will go you to the project where we plan to extend to the lifetime of such arrays by going against the spontaneous emission, by trying to reduce the spontaneous emission of atoms. 
So going to the Rydberg atoms. Of course, uh, as any atom, we should start with hydrogen, just to remind you that hydrogen atom has a pretty rich spectrum. So the levels are labeled by the principal quantum number n. So the lowest level, which we call ground state, has n equals one, and then goes higher and higher and higher. The spacing, so the level energy scales as one of the n squares. So you, you remember this from the basic quantum mechanics course. Each level is degenerate. So we also remember that we have two more quantum numbers, uh, angular quantum number and um, magnetic quantum number. So they degenerate in the case of the hydrogen. And the higher we go, the closer we come to the limit of the zero energy. So this is the limit where hydrogen atom gets ionized. And Rydberg atoms or Rydberg states are defined as states with very high principal quantum number m. Very simple. So if we go very close to uh, very high for ends higher than 10, let's say, so we're in the Rydberg part of the spectrum. Of course, the realistic atoms are much more complicated than just hydrogen. So we have first much more electrons, we have other properties, we have coupling with core, and so on and so forth. And in our experiments, experiments we're working with uh, rubidium atoms. Typically, we go, we climb up to the level n equals 15, which is pretty high. And in the presence of the electric field, this single degenerate level gets uh, lifts its degeneracy. And here you can see the manifold of n equals 15. So I just remind you for every single n, we have uh, um, angular momentum scaling from zero to n minus one. For each angular quantum number, we have magnetic quantum number, which goes from minus L to plus L. So all together, we have several thousand levels. Electric fields due to the Stark effect can lead to this degeneracy. We have really thousands of levels of this one single electron, which is far away from the core. And this makes uh, some properties. So we can go and look for the low L levels. So this is the levels with very small angular momentum. So we call it then low L. And also we have levels which have the maximum possible angular momentum, which equals per definition to N minus one. So where they're here. These levels are called circular because the orbit really resembles a lot a circular motion of a classical particle, charged particle around the nucleus. The orbit is really large. If you calculate the radius, it scales is proportional to the Bohr radius it scales as n squared. So in case of the n15, the size, the diameter is about uh, half a micrometers. So it's really microscopic atom. It's even larger than some viruses, as an example. So these atoms have many nice properties. First, it has a huge double moment. You see that electrons, which is negatively charged, the core positively charged, it creates a huge dipole compared to the ground state atoms. And this dipole makes possible the strong dipole-dipole interaction between two atoms, which are placed at some micrometer distance. Again, if we're talking about standard, usual, classical uh, atomic physics, so the interaction length or uh, the distance between atoms is just nanometers. So we, here we go a thousand times higher. Another thing is that the lifetime of these levels, even though it's very highly excited states, their lifetimes are extremely long. For the states with low L number, so we have 100 microseconds. To remind you, for the ground state atoms, typically it's some, some tens of nanoseconds. But if we go to the circular state, which are here in the extremity of this state with the very nice symmetric motion, we have the lifetime which goes to several tens of milliseconds, which is a million times longer than the ground state atoms or, or the atoms on the first or second excited state. So these atoms are extremely long lived and they have large interaction. Uh, they're easy to manipulate. So to prepare these atoms, of course, we have first to excite it. We have to give lots of energy. So the circular state cannot be excited directly by the laser light because this state have lots of angular momentum. And we're, we know that one photon can add only one angular momentum. So if you want to go here, you should get 50 angular momentum from several photons, which is impossible. So typically what we do, we just pump atom with light, with laser light to go as high as possible in energy and to have very small angular momentum. Once we reach the manifold, n equals 15, 
So you can imagine that orbit here is extremely elliptical. So electron comes very close to the to the nucleus and then goes away to large distance and then comes back like some commuters circling the, the sun. And then we try to inflate this orbit to make it more and more radio circular. We add lots of radio frequency photons, each carrying one moment of or angular momentum. And then we can end up in this nicely circular state with a very long lifetime. So that's basically the main properties of these atoms. And just again to remind you that uh, uh, one of the first experiments with quantum particles, uh, material particles, were performed about 30 years ago with uh, Rydberg atoms because they had a very strong interaction with the microwave field. So it's really microwave antenna. So now we're just going to the simulators. So to use Rydberg atoms in quantum simulators, it's not our idea. And actually there are many, many groups in the world using Rydberg atoms uh, so far, with one exception, with one uh, limitation. So most of the experiments or all of the experiments done so far uh, are performed with low angular momentum states, with states which can be accessed directly with the laser light and then read out almost immediately by the laser light. So, and the status, uh, state of the art is that people can make the arrays of atoms with no defects with several hundred atoms. So for instance, the foot of atoms, every point here is one atom. It's possible to make more complex structures like these uh, uh, Tardos or these Eiffel Tower. So every spot is just one uh, optical tweezers which can hold one and only one atom here. And with this system, we are able now to make very simple quantum simulations on quantum quenches when we change drastically the Hamiltonian of the system and just look at its evolution. We can go to adiabatic sweeps to look for the ground states. We can also look for the propagation of correlations and so on and so forth. Oh, and last but not least, so the observation of the topological phases have become possible also with this with these systems. So as any system, this one has also its own limitations. And the main limitation is the fact that these atoms, these low angular momentum atoms are not trapped. So they are free to move. And as so the simulation time is limited just by the time they spent in this uh, manipulation observation area. And even though the atoms are initially cold, they give us only some microseconds before they run away. Another thing, even if we try to, so to trap these atoms, the lifetime of these low L states is limited to 100 microseconds. So I say to you that this time is huge, but if you want to go to many particle systems like 100 atoms, and if every single atom has a lifetime of 100 microseconds, altogether the, the lifetime of your structure, like this square, will be 100 microseconds divided by 100. So we will end up only with one millisecond or microsecond measurement time, which is not enough for most of the interesting dynamics. And of course, most of the experiments are done at the room temperature in the vacuum chambers. We have lots of microwave radiation everywhere, something that you don't think about while working with ground state atoms. And this microwave radiation couples to atoms and just excite all these manifold to mix as the levels. So this measurement is not, is not nice. So our solution to this problem is very simple. We would like to go for the trapped circular atoms. So trapped means to increase the trapping time, so to hold it stable, and circular to increase the intrinsic lifetime. So why we can use still quantum uh, circular atoms for the quantum simulations? Of course, now I have to show you where we have this effective spin one half particle uh, that can be used for, for simulating dynamics. So just imagine that we choose two circular states with n equals 50 and another one equal n equals 42. So two circular states separated by twice the frequency of 56 gigahertz, yeah? And we can just label this state spin up, this state spin up, spin down, just our notation. And these states uh, can be coupled by the microwave field. Okay, in this term, it's two photon transition. 
this transition can be detuned. Yeah, we can have detuning as some tuning parameter. And this coupling has some rubber frequency, some coupling strength that depends on the power of the microwave that we can use to couple these two states. And now if we just imagine two atoms in this level structure place one to each other, we can rewrite after a little bit of magic, the interaction Hamiltonians of this two atom system into this way. So where the two neighboring atoms index G and G plus one can have the easing type interaction. So this is basically dipole-dipole interaction where two parallel dipoles try to expel each other, two parallel tries to attract each other. Coupling strength is just GZ. Then we have the spin exchange interaction. So one particle excited can bring its excitation to its neighbor, yeah? And again, it's in between neighbors with the sum coupling strain G. And then also we have two other terms which just count for the overall energy shift. It's just the longitudinal field. It's a kind of uh, um, magnetic energy and we have the effective transverse field for sigma Z and sigma X respectively. And in order to tune this, some of these parameters, so the full Hamiltonian should include also the external fields. So externally, we can apply magnetic field, the field B. We can apply the electric field F. These fields are in principle required to orient the dipole, the atomic dipole in, in, in some way here. And just by tuning these two fields, we can effectively tune the ratio of these two interactions, the easing interaction and the spin exchange interaction. So the ratio of GZ to G can be tuned from negative to positive just by tuning the electric field. And the value of electric field here is just several volt per centimeters. So it's it's really very small field. Oh, uh, so we can tune parameters, additional parameters to tune it, just the detuning and the coupling strength, as I said. So we can make some squinches, we can, we can change parameters quickly. We can also try of looking for the, for the uh, phase diagram of this chain. So we're talking about the chain of spin one half particles. And as a, as a function of, okay, here, I'm sorry, difficult to see. So, uh, so here's the ratio of the omega to delta. We can go between, sorry, we can go between different phases, paramagnetic phase to the paramagnetic phase. We can have also annealed phase. So these are phases when the, the dipoles are oriented parallel to the chain, and we can just study this um, phase diagram. Of course, this diagram is a bit trivial, so it has been solved numer numerically, so it's, it's known, but it shows to, high, to what degree we can really play with our atoms and to mimic or to simulate the spin one half uh, systems. So now the second problem, so to trap the atoms. So we can identify these two effective levels, spin up, spin down. So to trap these atoms is a bit more tricky. The atom looks as follows. So just to remind you, we have the external valence electron, which is highly excited, which orbits the, uh, the nucleus. And this electron is almost free. So it's really, you need only several volt per centimeter to ionize it. And this electron being placed in the oscillating optical field. Just imagine that we just shine on, shine on laser field with the frequency omega. We'll force this electron to oscillate as a quasi free particle. And this oscillation will make the, increase the energy of the electron, will make the positive energy shift. And as a result, this electron will try to to escape the high field intensity of, of the laser. So the electron will try to escape the laser to go away from the laser point. And being coupled to the nucleus by the Coulomb force, it will just pull the full nucleus and all other electrons together with, with itself. And it will just be trapped or it will just go to the light intensity minimum. So these experiments have been realized in several groups where people really were able to trap atoms in some minimum of the field. Okay, here we don't see the field, we have just the grating. So here we have the field zero, which is surrounded by laser lights. 
And our approach, for instance, is to use the tube laser beam. This is the so-called Lagarde Gauss uh, uh, modes with zero field inside, with the ring high intensity around, and then zero otherwise. So the atoms being trapped inside cannot escape because electrons should go through the light maxima. So, and this can, can help us really to trap atoms, to guide atoms, to manipulate these atoms. So with all these two, we are ready to start to realize, to build the array of trapped atoms. And here I will just use you our initial results in, in, in this direction. So as any other experiment with atoms, so most, almost any other experiment, we start just by trapping ground state cold atoms in the array of optical tweezers. Optical tweezers is just the uh, focal, points, focal points of the laser pulse. So here you can see just points. Just imagine that laser light comes from above, is focused to every single spot here. So we have lots of waste. So in these points, we have high intensity of the field. If we shine this structure onto the magnet optical trap with very cold atoms, these cold atoms will be attracted to these minima or to this maximum of the field, to the minima of the electric field of, of the, uh, of the uh, potential energy, sorry. Uh, and this is the method which is used uh, in uh, manipulation of DNA molecules, uh, moving atoms, uh, creating the structures to hold uh, Bose-Einstein condensate and so on and so forth. Once atoms are trapped here, we can shine the laser light to excite the atoms to the uh, to the rubic states. Yeah, so just we can imagine that in every in each point here we can get the rubic atom excited. But of course, as, as you know, rubic atoms do not light the field to maxima, they will try to escape all these points. So we should go to the trapping configuration as soon as we trap, as we excite rubics. And this is done by this ponderometive trap. Just after excitation, we just change the configuration of the field. Instead of having focused points, we'll have the focused bottles. So, so this is the trap. This is the cross section of the trap. It doesn't have the maxima in the middle, but it has a kind of bottle structure, and we call it bottle optical beam, with zero in the place of the atom, such that as soon as the atom gets excited to the rubric state, it starts to see zero, it's happy. And as soon as it has, it tries to escape because of the residual thermal velocity, it will see the high walls of the light field. So the atoms will be trapped in, its, in these cells, microcells. And the, the size of these structures are typical several micrometers. So the separation between these points is of several micrometers. And this is large enough or short enough to induce this strong dipole type of interaction. And this separation is much longer than the typical periodicity of the standard uh, light fields that are used for the cold atoms, as an example. So, so far so good, we have the atoms trapped. And now we can try to uh, go and try to build an experimental system which will allow to realize this. So what we do is the following. So you have the drawing of the system. Very important to have two short focal lenses. So you can see here lens on the other side. These are lenses which will allow us to prepare an array of tweezers. It will allow us to observe atoms, to collect the fluorescence and to have a high optical access. Then you have lots of ports, the holes to send laser beams. So we need lots of laser beams to cool and trap initial ground state atoms. And we're using uh, rubidium. Then to excite rubic states, and then we need a laser to trap this rubic state in the ponderometer potential, and also additional illumination laser just to collect fluorescence and to make detection. Last but not least, these atoms are surrounded by these big electrodes. We have many of them. The shape is a bit complicated. And these electrodes are need to perfectly control electric field because these atoms are very huge and electron is hardly, is barely coupled to the core. So it's almost free. And every small perturbation on the electric field will change the wave function of the electron. It, it will just move the electron here and there. It will disturb the electron. So we need to perfectly control this electric field environment. And in addition, we need also the radio frequency excitation to make these going from the low L state to the circular state. All this is done by this complicated structure of electrons 
and electrodes. So this is the quarter of the uh, build system. So this is just the supply cube on which we have all these uh, golded electrodes, cables, and so on, which allow really to control uh, to the high degree individual video metaps. And once this system is built test, of course, we don't make the measurement on the table. All of this is mounted inside of the cryostat in special frame into the cryostat. You can see the top of the cryo, then it should be closed. In addition to this single cryostat, you have two big optical tables to generate all these laser lights and all these makes what we call nowadays quantum computer quantum simulator. So, in order to detect atoms, because whatever we do, it's important to measure. And whatever we measure, we just measure atoms. I mean, that's the only way to get information. And we have two approaches. One is classical, I mean, standard approach based on the fluorescence imaging. So we can shine laser lights on atoms and just observe their fluorescence. If the atoms are not there, or if they're in the wrong state, they will not fluorescence. If they are there, we can see them. And this is the way people are taking pictures of atoms in, in optical lattices. In our case, since we're going to the Rydberg states, and the Rydberg states, as I said, you cannot be excited with the laser pulse. So it cannot be coupled to the laser. There is no photo scattered. So we do it in a different way. We excite atoms to the Rydberg state. And if the atom was excited, and if we don't switch on the trapping potential, the atom just goes away. And then we shine on laser light and we look. If atom is still in place, it means that it was not excited. Or it was excited to the wrong or to another rubric level. So we can make kind of very rough rubric state selective detection, which is, of course, destructive. But the advantage is that our detection is really spatially selective. So we can really see which atom on this lattice was excited and which one is, uh, was not. On another side, we can make detection directly on the Rydberg states. And this is done by the ionization. As I said to you, the electron is weakly bound and it takes only several volts per centimeter to extract it, to ionize it, and to send to the ionized atom, which is ion, which is very sensitive to the electric field. We can extract it from our system and then we just send it to the channel tron and we can detect it. Detection can be done very efficiently. And this ionization also depends on the state because the closer the, the electron to the atom, the smaller field we will need to ionize. So we can make rhythmic state selective detection, but unfortunately, overall detection is not spatially selective. We will ionize all atoms in this regular or irregular structure at once. But we have these two, two, two techniques that we can combine together and we can get different pieces of information at once. So to, have, to show you first uh, results, uh, so let's just think about single atom trapping or maybe trapping of individual atoms. So the system can be seen in this very simple case. So the picture resembles what I have seen, but a bit more simplified. We have the vacuum chamber where we have our atoms. We have the couple of laser beams which create the trapping potentials. And for this, we use spatial light modulators to go from the individual tweezers to the bottle beam beams and so on and so forth. Then we use the cameras that collect the fluorescence light here. And also we can use the camera to check the property of these SLM structures to check where every single tweezer is and so on and so forth. And the overall experiment is, um, is as follows. We start, of course, by, by cooling rubidium-87 atoms in the magneto-optical trap here in the middle. And then we'll load our first uh, optical, uh, load our dipole trap. In this experiment that I will show you, we will have created a grating of the, of the optical tweezers. So every point here, so we have maybe 10 times 10 points in which we can store one single atom. So these traps are so small that we cannot trap more than two atoms, more than one atom. And actually, as soon as we have two atoms simultaneously loaded just by chance into the same micro pocket, then they will feel very strong repulsion, they will collide and we will lose them. 
So when we load our grating in such a way, we have the loading efficiency about 0 0.6, 0 0.5. So this the probability to have one and only one atom per lattice site. Yeah. So that's why you see some, sometimes you see holes, sometimes you have points. And of course, to get this picture, we use just fluorescence imaging. We just illuminate atoms, they scatter light. They're still trapped, so we can collect enough light. And then just by looking the statistics of the light from every single cell, we can nicely discriminate the empty cells where we have basically the ground, the background uh, light from the cells with exactly one atom. So we can really nicely see the presence or abs absence of atoms. Next step is a bit more complicated. If you want to make simulations with irregular structures, you don't want to have all these holes and defects. It's too disordered. So we use a technique which is based on the sorting. You can imagine having additional laser beam, just one single optical tweezers coming from these two-dimensional acoustic optic deflector. And this one single laser beam can really focus on individual atoms, can take them because it has much higher intensity and can move, for instance, this atom to this point. It can move this atom to this point. And we can rearrange our arrays, which were initially completely random and built completely uh, defect-free regular arrays. So here are the same atoms, but after this sorting. So now we have no randomness, we have perfect control system. And of course, once we have the system, so, so far we have ground state atoms, so we can excite them to the rebook state. We can switch SLM to go from the dipole trap to the ponderometive trap, and we can measure, for instance, the lifetime of rhythmic atoms in these traps. And so far, the lifetime is several milliseconds, which is already a thousand times longer than was for the low L states with no trapping. So we have gained a thousand times on lifetime. And of course, we have gained approximately a thousand times on the lifetime of the atomic states. So we have the system which lives a thousand times longer. And also just to, for curiosity, we can combine the two detection techniques, for instance, detection by ionization. So we can just ch change the frequency of the laser light that we use to prepare a rhythmic atom. And we can see what's the probability of how many counts we get from the ionization of the rhythmic state. So this gives us the probability to be excited to the rhythmic state. And at the same time, we can look what's the probability for the ground state atoms to disappear from the trap. And as soon as we excite rhythmic states, atoms are not ground anymore, they're not trapped, and we see that they really fly away. So this shows that we have two comparable techniques uh, for the atom detection. Okay, so, so far so good. And now we can go for some interaction for some simulations. So honestly, uh, what I am going to show you, it's extremely recent. It's just maybe one month old. And of course, if you want to go to simulations starting from single atoms, the simplest thing is to go to two atom interaction. And here you can imagine extremely simple situation. You have two atoms, so two traps. So these are two tweezers, which are focused in, at some distance D. So we control this distance. And we can just excite Rubik atoms at these two points and just see interaction between these two atoms. And the interaction can be seen on the spectrum. So we know that if two particles sign to interaction, they create the grass states, we have the splitting of levels, so they have the level shifts, and this gives us the direct information about the interaction. So what we can do additionally, we can first prepare simultaneously many pairs. So we have the second pair here, third pair here, in order to increase statistics. So again, we're working with single particles. It takes a long time just to get signal at least for two particles. You want to get statistics. And second, you can apply the external electric field, magnetic field, and you can control the relative angle between these pair and the quantization axis. So this angle can be controlled just by placing these two tweezers. We can rotate them as we want using SLMs. Yeah? And then we know that a very simple theory of the dipole-dipole interaction. So we have two dipoles, 52C uh, state. And very simple theory of the dipole-dipole interaction tells us that the interaction potential scales in this way as a function of the angle theta 
between orientation of the dipole and dipole orientation is given by the quantization axis and given by the field, by the electric field. So the atoms are really oriented, to, let's say, vertically here. And the angle theta, which is the angle which connects the two dipoles together. So that's really classical formula. It's really one minus three cosine squared theta. And then the splitting can be measured. So the interaction can be measured just from the, from the level, from, from the spectrum. So we know that the, the tuning, uh, the, the splitting, which is measured just by measuring the splitting between these two sublevels or these rest states, which is positive and um, symmetric, anti-symmetric components of, of this uh, combined system. For some angle, the splitting is zero. So there is no interaction at all. For some re states, this splitting is, let's say, positive. For another, it's negative. You see that. So without going into details, you see that we can change the sign. So we measure the splitting between two peaks as a function of the angle applied that we change from zero to, to pi over two. And then we have these experimental points. So first you see that around the angle of about 55 degrees, this splitting is zero. So you can see it here. And this angle corresponds to this classical value when the two dipoles have this magical angle when they have no interaction. But then if this angle is smaller, so then the dipoles are oriented like this. So we have the attractive interaction. So the potential goes down, so the energy is negative. So for the angle theta, which is 90 degrees, so the interaction is like this. So we have the two dipoles, which are parallel, and we know that there is repulsive potential. So the energy here increases, interaction energy. And then this red line is just the fit with this function up to some um, uh, contrast. So this shows us that we can really control the interaction between two particles, and we can go from positive interaction to the negative interaction between just two dipoles, which are presented by two rubic atoms, just by properly choosing the orientation of this trap relative to the external electric field, or vice versa, you can see it just by rotating external electric field. So another parameter that you can choose, it's also the distance d. So here we know that the dipole-dipole interaction scales as one of the d cube, and you can just fix the angle theta as you want. You change the d, and then you just get the shift, which is really scales as one of the d cube, which is again the classical result, but shows to what degree we can really control the interaction between our, in our system. So and now I'm just going to spend several more minutes on the last part of the talk. So, so far, so good. We have this interaction between two particles and in the lab, we're now looking for the more and more complex uh, dynamics, complex geometries and systems. And we have long lifetime, we have milliseconds lifetime and we're pretty happy. But of course we know that one day sooner or later, we will be limited by this lifetime, definitely. So we would like to go even further to try to increase even further the lifetime of these atoms. But so far the only limit which still that we still have is the spontaneous emission. And as you know, spontaneous emission is something very fundamental. So any state will relax sooner or later due to the coupling to the vacuum fluctuation and then experiment has done. So our approach is to try to inhibit this emission just to protect the atom. So just imagine that we keep our atom inside of this capacitor, which is made by two very long conducting plates. So two electrodes, very long. If the spacing between these two plates is smaller than half the wavelengths at which atom radiates, just that it's small enough, this microwave cannot exist in this spacing anymore. So that's the property of the vacuum here. And there is no fluctuation of vacuum at these wavelengths. And if there is no fluctuation of vacuum at these wavelengths, there is no perturbation to the atom, so it will not decay. If you look on the decay rate, as a function of this separation in units of lambda, for the separation smaller than one, of one, one half, you see that spontaneous decay rate goes really to zero. Atom just basically stays excited forever. Of course, in the realistic case, if you put realistic parameters, it's not forever. We still have limited sizes and uh, purity and so on and so forth. But by taking all, to, all this into account, we expect 
we expect to get the lifetime of about a minute for a single atom, which, is, which gives us another factor of 1,000 on top of what we have so far. And with that, comparing to the interaction frequency between two atoms that we have seen so far with this uh, one megahertz, megahertz flip-flop rate, we should be able to see almost, I mean, many hundred thousand flip-flops operations during the lifetime of the system. And of course, this is now under construction. This is experiment which we're also building. Oh, here again, we will use the atoms from the external to demote. We will inject them into the cryostat, which will make this capacitor of very high quality. The atoms will be trapped by optical means, transported in dipole traps, put inside of this uh, inhibition capacitor. And then here, we hopefully will see these very long lifetimes. And now we have the, um, these pieces fabricated. So we start to build all these together in our lab. So, so I would like to finish by basically two photos. One photo is of the real quantum technology. So it's not those nice, fancy goldish photos from Google or IBM. So this is how real labs look like. And this is mainly for theoreticians and young students. So this is the real quantum technologies in the lab. And these are people who are working on all these quantum technologies. And here I'm happy to just to present our team, which is led by Serge Haroche, Jean-Michel Raymond, Michel Brune. And we have several projects and results that I have shown you were obtained on my project and on that of Clément Serrand at Laboratoire Castel Brossel in Paris. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm, uh, I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Igor, for this uh, excellent talk and the exciting research that uh, you are pursuing. Uh, it's, it's really amazing to see how current quantum optics uh, or quantum optical technologies allows us to, to simulate amazing quantum systems through uh, other, even more amazing quantum systems. So we are already a few minutes out of time. Uh, so let me quickly open the floor to some uh, questions. Uh, first question, uh, is this rhythmic approach universal, meaning can we also do algorithms? Uh, what type of elementary operation we can perform similar to H, I guess it's Hadamar and CX in superconducting? So I think the reformulation of this question is how can we uh, implement quantum computation using uh, this kind of approach? Oh, okay, yeah, thank you for your question. So I, I will try to, to be short. First of all, I would like to just to remind you that one of the first experiments in quantum computation in general, uh, back in the end of the 20th century, it was realized with Rydberg atoms and with microwave photons in the cavity. And again, that was the Nobel Prize of Sacha Roche for the quantum control of quantum particles. So basically all these main initial quantum logic operator, operations were first realized either with Rydberg atoms or with ions in the group of Dave Weiland who shared the Nobel Prize with Sash. So, in, so you see, you should be convinced that it's possible to make uh, basic quantum operations because it was done already 25 or 30 years ago. Yeah, but our approach is a bit, so now we just go, we want to go into other direction. We don't want to go to the discrete quantum computing with this standard approach for the quantum computers with the discrete gates and so on and so forth. Why? Because we see that technology is so advanced in solid state that um, quantum circuits can do it much better, faster and uh, with extremely high fidelity. So we don't want to compete anymore with them we go into another direction. And our direction is just continuous simulation of the quantum processes where you can have much longer lifetime and where the coher coherence is much longer. Because for the moment, in all these huge uh, solid state uh, or uh, superconducting qubits, for the moment, they're still limited by the coherence because they're in the bulk materials with lots of impurities. So we would like to profit to what we can still do better than other techniques. But uh, we, we can make Hadamas, we can interact. We have, there are so many proposals using two levels, three levels, uh, external cavities, additional lights coupled to the optical photons or coupling photons, light photons to microwave photons. So um, the field is very, very rich. Great. 
Thank you, Igor. Uh, another question. Uh, how do you manage to fit number of lasers for a large number of atoms, say 1,000, as each control only one atom? Yeah, good question. So it's basically, that's, that's nice. So just again, to make things clear, when we're talking about, for instance, cold atoms, and you see lots of pockets where we have atoms trapped, it's basically just several laser beams, very thick, which come together, interfere, and then in the interference pattern, we have all these structures. And the size between traps is basically lambda over two. So it's on the order of like wavelengths. We're doing differently. We have really individual tweezers, but they're generated in a simple way. We use again, special light modulator. Special light modulator is just array of microscopic mirrors. You can just imagine lots of small mirrors, which are illuminated by one single laser beam, very bright laser beam and each mirror is slightly modulated so it's rotated in such a way that the reflection or diffusion diffraction diffraction actually from these mirrors makes this extremely nice array of these donuts if you want and in this way you, you can make only with one big beam of one watt of power with one single element which is slm you can create array of beams and then not necessarily square it can be any, any shape, you have just to make this optical back propagation. You just take your wanted picture, you just propagate it back using Gaussian standard optics. You just mimic what should be the pattern, the face pattern of this SLM element in order to give you back the pure light, yeah? So that's really just one beam modulated with uh, these um, mirror arrays. And uh, that modulation of that uh, original beam is what requires that amount of wires and material that you showed in, uh, in the photo at the end of, of your presentation. Yes, uh, for the material we have, uh, that's, that's enough because as soon as these beams are generated, again, they're separated by microns. So the beam or these, all these, these micro arrays, they still, they are very close. So everything is within some hundred micrometers. So it's very small. And then the laser beam, they come from different directions into this box. Every single direction is nicely uh, adjusted. And then it hits, uh, each la laser hits really the region with atoms. So that's possible to do. But the material itself is a bit more tricky because the rhythmic atoms are extremely sensitive to the electric field. It's enough to have some charges, just several electrons of charge somewhere on the material seen by the atoms on the distance of some hundreds of micrometers or mil even millimeters in order to introduce the parasitic electric field, which will completely spoil the quantum coherence. And in that case, you have really to think carefully about what kind of materials you have to use around the atoms. So of course, everything is in a vacuum, but still you have some electrodes, you have the optical windows, you have mirrors, lenses, which come, come closer together. And this is the part of the quantum technology really to properly choose the right materials, right coating, metals, dielectric, uh, or something more exotic. And this takes more time actually. Amazing. Uh, yeah, just to follow up in the same direction, uh, on the photo you show, you just show the, uh, the, the directly show the, the experiment, let's say, open box, but uh, it might be nice to uh, emphasize that in order to to get such important results, those experiments need very careful isolation when they are turned on. Oh, excuse me, could you, could you repeat the last phrase? It was cut. So I would say that it, it, it would be nice to, 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 uh, to, to, to explain that those uh, this experimental setup needs to be uh, well isolated when it's turned on to get, to get those, uh, those reversal results. Sure, of course. No, that's of course. And isolation, it's in all respects, it's the vacuum, it's electric field, magnetic field, thermal isolation. That's why we need a cryo starts here. Again, computers of IBM or Google, so they are also inside of uh, box in the box in the box and all this is really to get rid of environment why because environment is decoherence and decoherence makes the Schrodinger cat dead or alive so so we have to isolate environment and of course all this is 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 about this proper isolation 
And that's why the mounting of the experiment, the designing takes really many years before you get to some results. Okay, great. Kate, another uh, question is, uh, I want to ask you about the choice of the Hamiltonian in the simulation of spin half models. What drove that choice and is the choice dependent on the atoms? Oh, the, the choice of the, uh, again, so we can, uh, for, first thing that this Hamiltonian is not really unique. So it's that if you choose the proper states, you can really mimic the interaction of spin one half particles, yeah? And in this case, it's even not x, y, z, it's really x, x because two directions which are perpendicular, so they are, they are the same. So we can choose this Hamiltonian because for this particular state. But to be honest, you're not limited just to these two states. You can go to other states. You can mimic the interaction of spin one particle. As an example, you can go for three states. You can go to other number of states or other type of interactions. It's just that, of course, the spin one half is the simplest system, which is pretty good understood in case of several atoms. And then it makes natural to start with system which is understood to test your quantum simulator. Because before going to simulating thousand atoms, you have to, to have some confidence into your, in your system. So you make a check on this much simpler, like five, 10 particles. And this Hamiltonian is already good enough really to make this kind of test. And of course, most of the problems are technical problems that have to be solved on this stage. So that's why this kind of Hamiltonian, which is at the same time very rich, because as I, as I should try to show here, we have lots of different phases. You go from paramagnetic to the uh, paramagnetic phase. You have these nil fails, which are really very nice. It's just the spins, just forward, backward, forward, backward. So it's a really complicated structure which is fairly good understood uh, theoretically. But I'm sure that on the long term, we will not be interested into this Hamiltonian. So we have many other proposals of other elements and systems or evolutions. Yeah, It's not like quantum computer where you have just several operators and then you can just combine them. So here the, the Hamiltonians, they have to be adapted for every single experiment. It's like with a classical simulator. You want to simulate the motion of planets or you want to simulate behavior of animals and both are classical simulators, but simulating completely different nature and, uh, and systems. So that's, uh, that's my very rough question, uh, answer on, on your question. Great, great, great. Uh, so before moving to some uh, more general question, I want just to ask one question. So, uh, at the uh, beginning of your presentation, Igor, you uh, enumerated some application uh, like uh, superconducted, uh, superconducted, superconductivity and the uh, topological phase of matter that may be simulated with uh, such uh, protocols. So in your opinion, what would be the chronological order of uh, the uh, immunity of, or efficiency of uh, neutral cold atoms in the simulation of those kind of new phases of matter? Oh, yeah, thank you for your, for your question. It's an extremely nice question. Um, so first, I, I have no answer to, uh, to this question, yeah? It's very general, it's very deep question. Um, so first, if we're just talking about some particular applications like uh, um, high temperature superconductivity and so on. So those systems are extremely complicated. So if you, if you look on the materials on which it was observed, it's not just one particle homogeneous materials, it's materials with complicated mixture of elements. It's very different particles. It's not just one type of interaction. So here for this spin one half, it's just spin-spin interaction. In real life, you have the dipole-dipole interaction, you have the magnetic coupling, you have spin coupling, you have much more things. It's much more complicated. So for the moment, uh, I, I don't know, I'm not aware of some experiments which are really close in simulating these realistic cases, yeah? But on the other side, I guess, just by knowing what our colleagues are doing with the cold atoms or super cold, ultra cold gases, quantum gases, they're also trying to simulate some matters, but more exotic. So actually they, they raise the question to some configurations which are interesting, which are exotic, which even never were observed in, in, in solid state or condensed matter. And they, they just try to look on the properties. 
And we know, for instance, with Cold Adams, we have seen BCS, BC crossovers, and many other things which, which we have not really seen on solid state or what's to some degree, yeah, especially if it's going about the one or two dimensional uh, structures. So that's why for the moment, I, I think that my opinion, but again, I, I'm just limiting in my, on my platform. I think we're pretty far away from simulating some really interesting, important condensed matter, solid state uh, uh, physics um, with some direct applications. Again, Oh, superconductivity is just one of the candidates. I think it's pretty far from there, but uh, you never know how far you will go with, with systems. Definitely, cold atoms are not the only candidates. Definitely, we have some limitations. One of them is really powers, laser powers. So you saw we have 100 atoms, it's okay, but if you want to go really to 1,000 atoms, and for each atom, you need really focus laser pulse, you need fraction of what? Altogether, you need tens or hundreds of watt of laser power inside of cryostat, and it's too demanding. It, it's impossible to realize. And of course, you you go to this natural limit. So there are there are many limits on on this. And the same with interaction types. Uh, uh, so that's uh, it's difficult to foresee what will be the real impact. I guess every single system that I showed at the beginning is looking for its own advantages or or some strong points and try to see, to look on some problems where these strong points can be really used, implemented, and where we can benefit from them. So there is no one single, it's not a quantum computer because on a quantum computer, if we are talking, we just, we can understand each other. I can understand people from cold atoms or from uh, some, I don't know, from, from any other system because we will change the Rabi frequencies, the Steenot gate, Hadamard gate, and we understand each other. But with quantum simulations, so there are so many different Hamiltonians, so different types of interactions, geometry, so that it's very difficult really to, to see at the same time all the field and to be expert in all configurations uh, simultaneously. 